The DNA of business has changed forever and there's no going back, according to Mitch Joel, author of Control, Alt, Delete. And Mitch is here joining us with more, and it's nice to have you here at TVO. It's my pleasure. I think we've got to start with, I mean, obviously anybody who uses a computer at all knows what Control, Alt, Delete means, but some people don't. So do you want to explain that? Really? So, okay. We are, some people <laughs> won't. I kid, I kid, some I kid, people I kid. won't. Um, it means reboot. It's, it's the, the key functions you would use on a PC to reboot your computer. And I jokingly tell people that command escape option didn't sound good, which is what you would do on a Mac. So, so, so yeah. that's why it's control alt delete. It is. Why do you think business needs to completely reboot nowadays? You know, I sort of I heard a story a long time ago about Cortez, who was the guy who they say discovered Mexico. I think if you go back historically, they were conquering. There wasn't much discovering <laughs> going on. And there's this sort of fable about him where a couple of his men were moving forward as he led the charge and said to him, you know, what's the plan? How long are we here for? When are we going back? And he burned the ships. No going back. And I, I've heard that story a couple times over the years, but it really struck me when I thought about sort of what businesses and brands are doing in this new technologically enabled world. That we're taking the sort of old ways of doing things, the sort of traditional advertising, traditional communications, traditional hierarchies, and trying to cram them into this very, very different world. And so I figured if I go and tell everybody to burn the ships, they're going to freak out and it won't really be relevant. So I sort of modernized it and I say control all delete. Well, let's use a modern example that you use in the book. Young girl wants a pair of sunglasses. Yeah. Go. Yeah, I mean, it used I, to, in the old days, yeah. In the old days, you'd, you'd take your buddy and you'd go down to the shopping mall and you'd sort of walk through and try on a pair of glasses and you'd look at them and say, do I look cute? And, and off you go. Uh, I tell people now that when you see two young women walking through a shopping mall, that's not two people. That's probably three or 4,000. How so? Well, they're connected. They're connected with their devices. They're texting friends. They're posting things. They're sharing. They're talking to each other, even through digital devices when they're physically there. And so what we've seen is that sort of social graph go that that's both virtual, become very, very physical. And I think it's really challenging for businesses to understand this hyper-connected, completely untethered consumer and what that means in this new construct. Everything really has changed. And so, yeah, for me, it really is a reboot for most businesses because they have to reimagine what it's like to sell to this consumer that is very much what I call that digital first posture. One of the things though that we've tried to revisit during these segments uh, for this agenda in the summer is, okay, things are changing in this way, but how do we make money off this? We meaning whoever's in business to do that. So in the old days when this person went down to the mall and tried on glasses and ultimately walked out of there with a pair of glasses and that's it, it's a different relationship now, right? So what are the potential buying opportunities that might be there now that weren't there back then? Well, one is we're now buying off of these devices. So, I mean, we, we, we have a whole new construct of, of if we're gonna speak specifically to, let's say, retail. Think about showrooming. Showrooming is the ability for anybody to go into a store, take a picture of a product, scan the barcode, or, or type it in, and see how much it costs anywhere else, Amazon, wherever it might be. And in that instance now, it's not just about price checking. You can actually physically buy it there. And showrooming is a major component of what has affected and changed retail. And so the question becomes, how do you as the retailer make sure that you can capture the consumer wherever they may be? You and I are talking about a book. I want to buy it. I don't have to walk up the street to the physical store. I can do it right here, right now, in the palm of my hands. And so if retailers don't pick up on that, you have the pure plate digitals doing it. Uh, and then you have the new startups who are sort of trying to figure out how you can leverage both these social forces that are coming into play and how to get people to really be a part of the brand experience and then have a function of selling, selling as well. Let's stick with retail though for a second. My, my hunch is most people are in retail because they have to be, right? That's what they do. They, that's their thing. Who teaches them about this new revolution that's coming? Well, hopefully agencies like mine, a twist image. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, there are, there are many agencies, there are many consultant-like people who can help them with what they're calling the omni-channel which is sort of capturing that consumer in whatever channel they may be. But you're right, I mean, the construct of retail, I, I always say retail isn't really retail, it's a real estate play. And there's a new real estate, and that real estate is the home screen of our devices, whether it's your iPhone or your Android or your tablet or whatever it might be. And brands have to make a very serious attempt to understand how they're gonna capture that direct relationship in relation to that physical device that's always on us. And it's not easy, and it's way more complex than it ever was, and there's more channels than it ever was. Mm. I mean, if I think about my book, it used to be, it's just in the bookstore as a hardcover. Now you can buy it as a hardcover in a bookstore. You can buy it as a hardcover online. You can buy it as audio. You can buy it as digital audio off of an Audible. You can buy it in digital format, Kobo. 
Amazon, Kindle, on and on. And even just trying to sort of like manage it as an author, it, it, it's overwhelming when you think it's just, it's just one book. Do you know what I find fascinating though? Even the most forward thinking authors still want a book. They still want something hard that people can put in their hands and underline or dog ear or whatever. Yeah. That says something, doesn't it? For now it does. I, I, I was genuinely sort of blown away when I was in New York City at my publisher's office and we talked about the sort of digital stuff of it because I actually exclusively read and I read about a book and a half a week on my, on my actually on my iPhone is how I read books. Um, I still like physical books. I still love the printed thing. Um, but to hear them say that the vast majority of business books are sold physically makes a lot of sense. It's like you said, I have it, it's on my desk, I can pass it to you, I can look impressive, I feel important on an airplane. <laughs> you can go on and on through the sort of ego re reasons we have this. But um, that all being said, I think that it is an adoption phase. And so the more and more people that adopt it, whether it's the devices like your Kobos and your Kindles, or just having the digital book on you and seeing that experience, um, it is very, very transformative and it's very, very alluring. I think why people like me like writing books is for a different reason. I, Personally, I blog every day, I have a column in the Harvard Business Review, I write for Huffington Post, and all of those are great. But to spend time thinking about the greater context of things and to piece it together in a way that is constructed and formed to the beginning, middle, and end in a more sort of meteor, spend time with it, piece of work, um, I think it's just this sort of creative spirit where you want to do more than just blog. And we should point out, you're a Montreal guy, right? Montreal guy, and I'm actually, you know, I really am a digital marketing agency guy. I use these channels because they're sort of like a creative gasket for me to, to think about every day. Let's, we, we talk retail, and I wonder if you could give us your sense of how things are going across sectors. Which sectors of the economy are in sort of a much greater need to reboot, say, than other sectors are? You'll see uh, industries that have sort of gone through the dramatic disruption, the music industry, certain segments of the entertainment industry, You'll see industries right now on the cusp, governments, education, things like that, that are sort of moving towards these models. And then you'll see industries that are just very, very innovative and sort of trying to move it along faster. That might be things like the newspaper industry, maybe. It depends on, on the sort of areas that you're looking at. And then you have this whole other area where they're just sort of, as Don Tapscott would say, they're bathed in bits. They're sort of just hmm. doing this stuff. The thing that I still can't get my head around is who's going to, where is everybody going to work in this future world of a rebooted economy? And I guess the, I mean, the example people love to, to show is Kodak, which of course had, I don't know, 100,000 employees once upon a time and was worth $28 billion, and now of course it's underwater. And this thing called Instagram, which is worth a billion dollars, employs 13 people. Same month, right? It actually filed chapter 11, the month that Instagram was bought by Facebook for a billion dollars. So help us understand how anybody's going to have a job in this new world. You're sort of traipsing into the, the, the sort of raw, raw sediments I have for this third book. And uh, the working title of it is We Robots. And uh, I'm trying to put forth a theory in, in, a blo in another blog that I do called We Robots. I'm sort of tumbling a lot of this information where I think we're sort of focused on the wrong area. And I think what we're focused on with technology is this idea of technology equals automation overall. I think where we're going, uh, there'll be a big segment of this where it'll be technology as a form of augmentation. Mm -hmm. And we're talking a lot about automation and not augmentation. Augmentation would be your ability to be better at the work you do because of technology. Um, there's an, a fascinating company called Double Robotics. Uh, if you look at the product, it's basically a broom handle on two wheels that you slide an iPad into. And the idea with it is, is that you can do telepresence meetings but the actual telepresence device isn't fixed in your boardroom. It moves around like a robot. Hmm. And so if you're sitting down, it'll actually lower to your level. And if you've ever done FaceTime on an iPad, it's pretty present. I mean, you really are there. And you think about that, your ability to work in Toronto, but then telepresence to a meeting in Minnesota, and then at the same, two seconds later, be in Singapore. And you sort of see these devices, and you go, these robots aren't going to automate our lives. They're going to augment them. They're going to make us better at the work that we do to make us more efficient. And I think that there are many sectors, and, and a lot of this comes back to that question of education, which is a big one. How do we train the people of today and the people of tomorrow for a different type of economy? Because the truth is we are out of, if not long gone from that industrial one. That's a more positive interpretation, I think, than most people are prepared to go along with. Most people seem to think this is going to be a shark infested pool that a lot of people are going to be getting into and there aren't, you know, a lot of people are going to sink. 
I think it's true, and I always think it's true, especially when you have mass disruption like we're having, and there's no doubt about that. But I, I do think that the event horizon is longer than we think. People will talk to me about social media as if it's this sort of new, fun thing. It's 15 years. We've had 15 years of the commercialization of social media. It's existed before that for sure. And so when businesses say things to me like, uh, we don't know where to get started, or we feel like we're behind, I'm like, it's 15 years, but at the same time, people move slow. So as time moves extremely fast, and we're having this massive exponential growth now in terms of technology innovation, in terms of business, marketing, communications, I think we still move really slowly to, in terms of adopting It's part of the reason why I wrote the book. I don't want to write about trends. I talk about them as movements. They're mm -hmm. fundamental movements that have changed business forever. And so when people get scared by that, my answer is I actually think my book and I actually think the concepts I'm talking about is, is, an, is an option of possibility and opportunity. And so where people feel those sort of shark infested waters, I see tremendous opportunity and tremendous potential for those who are willing to sort of open up to the prospect of doing a different kind of work. And I think a very important type of work. We have physical buildings here that we've all architect, that we've done a mass amount of planning around, some cities better than others. Mm. We are now doing that in these digital realms and they are dynamic and fascinating. And, and those, those young people of today you know, when you talk about multilingual, I really do think that one of the languages they should be studying is code. <laughs> so every Canadian citizen should know English, French, trilingual. and code. I'm a big fan of turning this country into a trilingual country. I think we would have uh, a leg up if you especially look at the sort of global landscape in terms of what we could do. I think a good third language is, is, is about time. I think you're not being yeah. entirely facetious here. You, no, mean, I, you think I'm, people should know how to write code? Uh, write, read it, or understand it. I, I think that if you're sort of looking at a vocation and saying, where do I sit in the grand scheme of things? What an amazing opportunity to come in in a world that is completely nascent. I mean, with all of the developments we've had, it's still very nascent. You have a, a young man like Dave Karp of 26 years old who starts this Tumblr idea and sells it for a billion dollars to Yahoo. Um, that's a, that should act as, a, as, a, as, a, as an image that we hold up to society and say, think about this. You don't have to go to a job every single day in that office in that cubicle because you think you need a phone and a stapler that you can actually creatively invent your future. So Mitch, as long as we all learn how to squiggle, we're going to be okay. I'm a big fan of the squiggle. Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> I, I saw that yeah. and you're going to tell us what it means. So yeah, the, so the construct of the book was, I, I, I wrote it based off of these five movements that have changed business forever. And I would have been like, check mark done, book is fine. And then I realized, what, what we've been talking about a little bit, like what does that mean to me? Like how do I explain to myself, my kids, my peers and coworkers, how you go to work in this environment that has so fundamentally changed? Mm -hmm. And so I changed the book a little bit and created a second part called it Reboot You. And one of the triggers that I talk about in the book, so the triggers are the emotional, physical and psychological things you gotta bring to your, your, your work-life balance, is this idea of embrace the squiggle. And the squiggle is, is myself, and it's probably you too, it's looking back on your career and realizing that it wasn't very linear. And, and the, the way it came together is I was having lunch with a friend, and she's a very successful engineer, and she was miserable. And I'm like, what's going on? And she's like, you know, in high school, I was okay in math and science. I sat down with a guidance counselor, and they said, you should potentially look at engineering. And she said, okay. And so she went to university, did well, got the job, got the house, got the kids, got the whole thing, happy. She's miserable. And I jokingly said, it's pretty amazing that these decisions you made at 16 like completely predicated your entire life. And her jaw hit the floor. And I realized at that moment that I wouldn't want even pictures of me when I was 16, <laughs> other, let alone the decisions I was making at that time. Mm. And the truth is, is that the most interesting people that we have and that we know have very squiggly careers. They're not linear. Linear being literally the line that goes up at a 45 degree angle. You started there after school and off you went. We are in a world where the most interesting people we know, the people that we sort of hold up and say, how did they do it? They are very, very squiggly. And you could look at people like Richard Branson, and you could look at people like Steve Jobs, and you could probably look at people like you and I and say the exact same thing. And so if you can embrace that, that your career is gonna be very different, and it's true, we had a world where you would work for 40 years, you get a gold watch, you have a rubber chicken dinner and a plaque, and you're done. Mm. Uh, off you go to Mexico. We shifted to a world where it was, what, four to five jobs per career, Oh, either job hunting, what's going on with young people. You stop with that for a second, you realize we live in a world now, and this has been statistically talked about and data driven, that the average person will have four to five careers in their mm -hmm. lifetime. So can, we are in that change. Can you be taught to squiggle? 
I think you can, I don't know if you can be taught it. I think you can be enlightened by it. You can sort of understand it and then allow yourself the levity to go down that journey. Because I, I wonder whether some, you know, some people can and some people can't, right? And I'm sure there are, there are people who've been extremely focused and who had very successful lives that you probably wouldn't really consider sort of all that squiggly. Mm. I'm just talking about the fact that because of the disruption of technology, because of the fact that one person with a laptop or an iPad can build a billion dollar business in their apartment, <laughs> completely and fundamentally changes the construct by which we know business. If you look at a platform like Kickstarter, crowdfunding engine, mm -hmm. just think about it for a second and go, this idea that you would have an idea in a shower and come out of the shower and create a business plan around it and get it tested and marketed and have prototypes done and sell it. Kickstarter, you put the idea out as a video with a simple prototype and you have physical sales before you have a business plan. If that doesn't implode the chasm of entrepreneurship and fundamentally shift what it means to be in business, you have a pebble watch the digital watch that sinks to your iPhone, they did $10 million in sales in under 30 days on Kickstarter. We're not talking about Casio or Swatch. We're talking about two guys in Palo Alto. <laughs> so tell us about how we're moving towards an era of direct relationships with consumers then. We, we've always been in a place where the most important thing a brand could do is have that direct relationship with the consumer. What has fundamentally changed in this movement is the fact that now you're not just at war with your competitors for this direct relationship and the, and, and the, and the business. You're at war with your partners. And that sounds really confusing to people, but think about you know, your day-to-day -day life. You decide to buy a pair of headphones, Sony headphones, let's say. You buy them at Walmart. Everybody's telling you to like them on Facebook, follow them on Twitter, all that sort of stuff. And if you thin slice that and just focus on Facebook as the engine, so you've liked them on Facebook, Sony headphones, you've liked Walmart on Facebook, check, and you're on Facebook. Just think about all of the inputs you're getting for one pair of headphones that you bought for probably under $100. It's a lot of marketing going at one consumer in one channel. It's, it's overwhelming. And I believe brands have to ask themselves, who owns that direct relationship? And the answer to that question is, if I were sitting in front of you and you were working for Sony, I'd say you should own that direct relationship. But if you weren't Sony and you were Walmart, I'd say to you, you should own the direct relationship. And if this weren't Walmart and you were actually Facebook, I'd say you should own the direct relationship. And mm -hmm. that's the point. The point is that we live in this world where everybody's at the trough for that direct relationship and everybody has to own it. And consumers are obviously pushing back against this. Some are very into it, but we really need to figure out as a business entity what that looks like because it's not just your competitors anymore. Is there a value proposition in it for you as a consumer to spend the time required to like this and contribute to that and so on? I think some brands do it exceptionally well. Some brands really understand how to create an experience and how to build. I would, I, I'm not sure if I'm a big fan of the, of the word loyalty. I believe in loyalty engines, but they're more rewards than they are true loyalty because I think people would change if the money is better or if they get points somewhere else. But I absolutely think some brands understand the flow of which they could engage with a consumer, keep them interested so that they're always in that sort of top of mind place. But this idea that you, know, you would sort of watch a show for a bit, move to commercials, and, and that consumer would get some impressions, they'd get some impressions of ads, has changed because impressions are everywhere. Hmm. They're in your Facebook feed, they're in your Twitter feed, they are, they are plastered all over us visually, and, and there is a lot of noise and some would even say pollution when it comes to that. I'm very interested in what you see transpiring in the industry in which I work. And let me set this up by saying the following. When I started here, we did, uh, I did two weekly programs, and they were on once, and if you missed them, They're tough. gone. Yeah. Right. Nowadays, I'm not even sure I'm working in television anymore because, uh, you know, as many people watch our product on their little screens that they carry in their pockets or their computers or they plug them into their flat screen TV sets or so is television becoming less relevant? I don't think so and so I sort of have television falls into two movements one of the movements is what I call the one screen world people talk about three screens you got TV internet and mobile some people say four is the tablet I don't believe it. I think there's a one screen world where the only screen that matters is the screen that's in front of me. We're in a world where screens are ubiquitous, they're cheap, they're connected, you can get content anywhere. So I think TV is in that world of you can get content anywhere. I think that the challenge of television falls more in how the consumers deal with this content. And so in the book I talk a lot about, it's not being social media or digital content, it's about whether people are active or passive with the media and whether the media is active or passive. And I think we take for granted the amazing beauty that happens in these types of moments where I could be on my MacBook Air and I can close the lid and just watch the agenda. I don't have to plus one it, like it, tweet, share, talk <laughs> about it, create anything. I can just enjoy the content 
and, and what it does and the value it adds to my life. And yet the industry that you're in, the television industry, is forcing TV to be like the internet. And I think we are going to have, while, it, while they'll call it convergence, I would say I think there's going to be a lot of friction. Because I think there's a vast majority of the population that simply likes to sit back, forget about the day they had, don't think about the day that's coming tomorrow, and just watch things that are relevant to them, whether it's a hockey game or something more informational like this. And so I really do think that that disruption is, is, is sort of twofold. One is, I want to get this content anywhere and everywhere. So what if I wasn't home at 8 o'clock PM on Thursday night? Who cares? I'm willing to pay for it. Give it to me. Hmm. But the other side is, is that consumers are still fundamentally passive with their video content. But in the same way that for some people, and I might be one of them, this is still the foundation. I know you can read this in four or five different formats, but this thing that I'm holding in my hand is still the foundation of literary content, if you want to call it that. Is television still the foundation for the content that we are creating right now that people can watch in any number of different platforms? It's a format within video. So personal story, I hop on a plane and I rent a documentary on iTunes. And I watch this documentary, it's a great movie, and I love it, and it ends and this sort of screen implodes and it goes back to like the iTunes thing. And I ask myself, what made that a movie? I mean, there was no popcorn, there was no screen, there was no, I just rented it from iTunes digitally. It's a, it's a zeros and ones, it's on an iPad. I watched it on a plane and it's gone. What made it any more a movie than a YouTube video or any more a movie than watching one of these episodes as a podcast? I grappled with that and the answer was I didn't have one. I think we are, we are still using different terms to define what we think. Mm -hmm. And so currently we'll call this TV, but I do think that the distribution of this content into the other channels creates it as a video format and less as a TV based format. But this idea of that set top box and that centralized area is a fixed thing, that's changing really rapidly. And once upon a time, we would have walked a few blocks to the corner to go to a blockbuster and pick up a video that we wanted to bring home and put it into a machine and watch. And of course, no one does that anymore, do they? Well, I would even push that further. I'd say right now you're downloading music from iTunes uh, onto your hard drive and you're filling up all this, this, this extra memory. Uh, why? When you can do a Spotify or an RDO for $7 a month and have access to the world's content. Okay, time out, time out. We can do what? So Spotify yeah. is streaming audio. How do you spell that? S-P-O-T-I-F-Y. Okay. RDO, which is radio without the A, owned by Skype, actually. And it's a subscription service for music, so you spend 7 to $10 a month, and you have unlimited access to the entire catalog. Hmm. And so right now you would say, well, I take some planes, or I'm sometimes in a place where I can't stream. I hear you, but Google Fiber Optic, lots more connectivity, internet connectivity as if we have radio frequencies. All of that is, we're, we're, we're one, you know, we're a little kitty corner away from that. And you suddenly start saying, like, why am I downloading and hogging up these hard drives with all this data? When if ever I need anything, it's just there. Look at the Netflix model. It's mm -hmm. a great example. It's a subscription-based. You don't own the physical movie. Why would you want to own the physical movie when for $10 a month you can have access to every movie? And those are the sort of different types of constructs that I want people to think about in terms of what their lives are and what that means and then how that applies to your business. Because I think what it does is it introduces new business models as well. Oh, and just the implications for the look of your street are going to be different. There's no more... There's no more video retailing anyway. I shouldn't say there's no more. You've still got the, the specialty shops and so on. But, but, think, yeah, but think about shopping malls. I mean, this idea of like the anchored by the big department stores. What do shopping malls really look like now? They look almost like small towns or mm. they look like spider-like complexes because you have comedy clubs and restaurants and you have different things because that idea of the anchored department stores, we've changed as, as a people. We really have changed. And this digitization it has not let up. It is exponential. I think we're still in an exponential curve. And we sort of say exponential and toss it aside. It's pretty dramatic. I mean, exponential is nothing that we as humans can really understand. Uh, I always frame it for people by saying the iPad didn't exist three and a half years ago. Shocking. Now, you can't, I mean, nobody buys a PC. The PC mm -hmm. sales are completely tanked, and tablets have ruled <laughs> and are ruling. Mitch, I got about a minute left here, and I got a big question for only one minute to go. So apologies, but we started with the story of the two girls who were going to the corner store to, or to the mall to buy sunglasses. And you mentioned that even though they are side by each, they're probably texting each other and their friends as they're doing this experience. Do you have any qualms about whether we're losing an ability to do this anymore? We are. 
I mean, we fundamentally are. And so you can look at it and lament that and say, oh, woe is the day when we would sit by the fires and have conversations without electricity and things like that. Or we can ask ourselves really you know, more powerful questions. And I think the more powerful question that I'd like to ask is, are we managing technology or are we letting technology manage us? Great question. What's the answer? The answer is if you're really good at this stuff, you're managing your technology. I carry an iPhone around that does not beep, buzz, blink, or anything. I get one special tap that I've assigned to it when my wife texts me. Hmm. Everything else can wait. I can check the email when I want, the Twitter feeds when I want, and all that stuff. I see too many of my peers who, are, who latch onto it. I mean, we literally have a term. It's called time to device. The time to device is from when you wake up, how quick are you to touch your device? <laughs> the sad tragedy is we're in a world where most people are doing that before their spouse. Hmm. We got to work on that, don't we? We do. Mitch Jewell is the author of Control, Alt, Delete, Reboot Your Business, Reboot Your Life, Your Future Depends on It. Amen to that. Thanks so much for coming into TVO tonight. My pleasure. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate meeting you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.